So I have an event to go to later this month. It is a romantic era picnic. And at first I thought I would wear this 1840s gown that I made like three years ago, but I tried it on and it does not fit. So my other option was to make a new dress, which I really didn't want to do because I didn't want to spend the money on that. And then I thought, maybe I should remake this dress. Even before it didn't fit, it still had some problems. I made this with a laughing moon pattern and the pattern's really great, but I made some mistakes. I used this cotton print, which is a quilting cotton and it's a little too thick to do these really detailed sleeves. There are like three layers here. There's this sleeve, there's this sleeve, there's this sleeve, and then there's piping in the seam. And then there's all these little tucks. So it gets really bulky. I also did kind of a poor job on the cartridge pleating in here. It's just a little too big. I think if I were to do it over, I'd make these pleats tighter. Although this was a lot of work because this is three full widths of fabric in the skirt, which is like 120 inches around that I cartridge pleated by hand. It's still a good dress and there's nothing wrong with it that I can't fix if I really tried. And since I don't want to spend money on a new dress, I'm going to rework this one. To redo this dress, I need to focus on three main areas, the sleeves, the sides, and the skirt. I'll start by taking off the sleeves, removing all the extra sleeve layers, and re-sew the underarm seam to get a little more range of motion. I'll use fabric from the extra sleeves to make more piping that I'll use for the armhole seam. Next, I'll use more fabric from those extra sleeves to add width to the side seams. I'll have to take off the piping along the waist to do that, and then I'll need to add more piping on later. Then I need to completely disconnect the skirt from the bodice, unpleat and repleat the entire skirt to double the number of pleats by making them half as wide as they are now. But first, I have to unpick all of those seams. And there's something enlightening about revisiting an old project like this. For one thing, you realize how dull your seam ripper is. But besides that, you wonder why you made some of the decisions you made. Like, why did I sew the entire lining separate from the outer fabric, rather than just flatlining all those pieces? Or why did I only pipe some seams and not others? Because almost all of the seam lines in 1840s dresses would have been piped. But I only seem to pipe the waistline and the armholes not the wrists or the neckline or even the shoulder seams. Oh, and one more thing. Yes, I know this isn't an accurate 1840s cotton print, so don't at me. I was doing the best I could at the time, but I did not just pull this little red floral print out of thin air. In my Pinterest research, I did see examples of red on white cotton print dresses. I also knew that small busy prints were popular then, and a print like this could have been block or roller printed. And the three velvet ribbons on the sleeves were copied from a surviving dress that I saw, so that part at least is legit. That being said, no, this fabric is not period accurate. Maybe one day I'll sew a new dress that is, but today is not that day. Here are all of my sleeve pieces. Let's do a quick count. There's a lining in here, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, Seven layers of fabric in one seam. Oh, that's too much. The seam allowances on this dress were 5 eighths of an inch, and luckily I didn't finish the sleeve seams, so I had the full seam allowances to work with. From the underarm point, I sewed a new seam with quarter inch seam allowances and blended back to the normal 5 eighths at the elbow. With the original stitches unpicked, I now have a full three quarters of an inch of extra room in the bicep area. Now back to the bodice. I measured the length of the side seam to plan my wedge filler piece. I took one of my leftover sleeves, which was cut on the bias, which is why I'm slicing off one of the corners to get a straight edge, and used my rulers to cut out the shape I needed. I knew I needed to cut my fabric three quarters of an inch at the armhole, and about one and a quarter inch at the waist plus seam allowances. Then I used that first piece to cut a second, and I also cut out two lining pieces to match.
those little wedges got inserted into each side. Here's the bodice now with the side panels in. So the good thing about this fabric is that the pattern is so busy you don't really notice the seam lines. I think the last thing I'm gonna do tonight is make some piping and attach it to the armhole here. For the piping, I cut one inch wide strips of fabric from my scrap sleeves. Because I had trimmed the seam allowances on my original piping in the armholes, I figured it would just be safer to make all new piping for the arms. My friend let me borrow her piping foot. I've never used this thing before, so we'll see how this goes. I've got my fabric strips cut, and then I also have the same cotton cording I used for the original piping, so I know it will match. Then I sewed my new piping into the armholes. So I was going to reattach these sleeves, but then I realized uh, I don't know which way it goes on, so I didn't want to put the sleeves on backwards. So I thought I'd get out the original pattern and look at the pattern pieces. And then I noticed that all of these versions have some form of these little kind of cap sleeves. Uh, I believe they're called mancherons. I don't know, it's French, it's always French. So my plan had been to just take off all the extra sleeve bits and just have the one main long sleeve. But then I thought, ugh, would that be accurate? I went looking at other fan front dresses and it seems like most of these have some kind of little cap sleeve business on there or a shorter oversleeve. And if they don't have a cap, it seems like the volume of the sleeve is lower and it may be a little bit later dress, like the 1850s, like this one with the ruffles. So I have to decide, do I want to add those little caps or not? I found the piece for the little upper sleeve. My problem is I only have the old upper sleeve pieces to make this work but this piece is on the bias and my old sleeve is on the straight grain. So I'd have to cut it like this. And two, this piece is way wider than this piece. So easy decision, not gonna do those sleeves. My other problem is there's nothing on the sleeve cap that indicates which side is the front or the back. It does have these gathering stitches on the side. I'm pretty sure that this is the back side, but I'm going to go through the instructions and just double check. And after some digging around in the pattern instructions, I was pretty confident about which sleeve went on which side, so I sewed the sleeves into the armhole. Following the stitching line I just made when attaching the piping. And I went ahead and attached the piping to the waistline. For that piping, I just added one little bit of new piping to the end of my original piping, rather than creating all new piping. Oh, that's a lot of piping. And onto the skirt. This next part is all a hand sewing technique called cartridge pleating or gauging. It requires hand sewing two perfectly spaced parallel lines of stitches, which are then gathered to form neat pleats but first you have to fold over the raw edge of the fabric. This part is the center front, which is folded down about four inches. The back side is only folded about one inch because the back of the skirt is slightly longer than the front. This creates a folded edge that will be used to attach the skirt to the bodice later. I'm using waxed buttonhole twist thread because it's the thickest thread that I have, and these threads need to be super strong because they can be under a lot of strain. I'm also using this nifty stuff called tiger tape. It's a narrow masking tape with printed vertical lines spaced one quarter inch apart. I place the tape about a quarter inch down from the fold and use the little marks as my guide, sewing two identical lines of stitching, one line above and one line below the tape. 
And when you pull the threads, the fabric looks like this. I am stitching the skirt cartridge pleats to the bodice. Here's my piping line at the waist seam. Basically, I have to pick up a little bit of the fabric, then I come through the fold <laughs> at the front of this pleat, like that. I pinned the pleats to the waistband in a few places just to help evenly space out these pleats. The pleats before were twice as big, so I had half as many of them, and it kind of made like gaps in between them. Having these smaller pleats should make for a more dense pleated look. 1840s dress refit is complete. The skirt is reattached. You can see my little side panels here. And it fits, it's actually a little bit big, which is fine, I don't mind that. Also, yes, my dress form is very short. That's because it's broken, and this is as tall as it will go. About three feet high, which is why I don't use it very often. Before I try it on with all the under things, I'm actually going to make a new little bustle. So American Duchess has a tutorial for a 1830s bustle. I know this dress is 1840s, but they both have the big bell-shaped skirts. So I have some cotton ticking, which is a really uh, tightly woven, dense fabric, kind of like duck. And then I have some cord. This is three millimeter macrame rope. This is the whitest stuff that I have. I think in her, her tutorial, she uses stuff thicker, but I don't have anything else, and I'm not gonna go out and buy it. So I'll go through how to make this. I did some measurements. I think I want the bustle at the waistline to be 16 inches wide. This is 33 inch wide ticking. So now I have to have a straight edge along the bottom so I can add the cord. I folded over two inches from that straight edge that I ripped. Now in the original tutorial, she did two rows of cording, but mine is a lot thinner, so I'm thinking maybe I'll do four. That's all four rows of cording complete. I also just trimmed the little tails and stitched over the edge right here. I'm not really gonna worry about this. I do need to now hem this raw edge. So I just need to fold it under and stitch it. I repeated these steps with the other side of the fabric, then split the fabric in half to form two layers. From there, I pleated the layers. I didn't really measure, I was just trying to get the overall length of the fabric down to about 16 inches. Well, today is April 25th, and my event was on March 28th. Except it would have been, but it got canceled, along with my enthusiasm for finishing this project. But I only have the waistband left to do, so I think I'm just gonna try to power through and finish that today. I'm ripping the fabric again to get perfectly straight lines when pressing it. I need to make a strip of fabric a little bit longer than my waist by two inches wide plus seam allowances. This gets sewn to the bustle right sides together. The waistband will close at the side rather than the front because I want to reduce the amount of bulk at the front of my waist. The waistband gets folded backward and sewn shut at the short ends and along the wraparound belt part. I turn the waistband right side out, and yes, turning tubes is annoying, and after 15 years, I still don't have a foolproof, easy way of doing this. Then I pressed it, tucking in the seam allowances on the wrong side. At first I thought I would hand sew the back side of this waistband because that's what I normally do with my waistbands. But then I came to my senses and remembered that no one will ever see this, so I sewed it by machine. 
Lastly, I rated my stash for two hooks and my very last two eyes. Seriously, I have a ton of hooks, but no eyes. Where did they all go? And I sewed those on by hand. The waistband actually has a few inches of overlap because if I've learned anything from re-sewing this dress, it's to leave some extra room in case you need it later. And here's the finished product. It's not perfect, but it's certainly wearable. And since I can't go anywhere right now, I'm just dressing up in my backyard. I'm wearing this dress with my 1840s silk bonnet, a chemise, Victorian era corset, and three petticoats. One giant 1860s style petticoat, one regular petticoat, and one corded petticoat. Oh, and of course the 1830s bustle. I learned quite a bit from this project. One, I thought that refitting this dress would take much longer than it actually did. But it wasn't that complicated, just tedious at times. It also made me realize how much I've improved in my costume making over the years and what I would do differently if I made this pattern or another early Victorian costume again. For example, I'd certainly use a more historically appropriate fabric and I would choose the front closing version instead so I could get dressed by myself. I also think I could use a corset cover because there's a very clear corset line on the back bodice of the dress. This project also helped me come to terms with my size. Granted, this dress was always too small for me, but now I don't have to try to squeeze into a corset to fit into this dress. And I think the 1830s bustle does a pretty good job of making that bell shape. I had made another bum pad thing when I first made this dress, but I didn't really like the shape it gave. It was more of a shelf bustle look than a gentle curve. Oh, and another plus, I can move my arms. Well, with this drop shoulder style, it is nigh impossible to lift your arms over your head. And proper Victorian ladies wouldn't be waving their hands in the air like they just don't care. But at least now I can move my arms in a general upward direction. So I'm calling that a win. Thanks for following along with me. Please let me know if you liked this video by giving me a thumbs up and comment below if you've ever had to refit an old costume. Thanks again and see you next week.